every yeah. year than to all professional sports events combined. People don't go to aquariums to learn. Yeah. They come to have fun, to be entertained. But once they're in the door, if we can snooker them into learning something, <laughs> then we have succeeded. It gives aquariums an obligation to responsibility. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's show, The Sea Has Many Voices. And this is a very special episode because I've got Dr. Jerry Schubel, the president and CEO of the Aquarium of the Pacific. But beyond that, Jerry has uh, been an important mentor in my life uh, in science and policy. I worked for him for 12 years <laughs> at another institution. And it's been great to come back and work with you again, Jerry. And you've been a, a co-creator of this show, as a matter of fact. So thank you for that. You are welcome. We're delighted to be a partner <laughs> with you again, Greg. Yep. And uh, we've, uh, Jerry has been uh, facilitating uh, this podcast along with others, and I, I finally got him in here for a conversation on the show. So uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to ask you about. Um, the, you know, the main thing, Jerry, is that uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific is more than a fish tank. Yes, you know? well, that was the mandate that when I was hired that I was given by the board. And uh, as you know, I spent most of my career in academia, yeah. 20 years as the dean at Stony Brook and three of those as provost. And then I, many of my colleagues thought I went over to the dark side <laughs> when I joined. Is the, that right? Is the, that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> said, poor, poor Jerry, he's having a midlife crisis. Uh, went, <laughs> went, and I went to the New England Aquarium to join you. Yes. Uh, great aquarium and was there for seven years and then was recruited to come out here in 2002. Yep. And I've been here now then for... 17 years and had a great time. That's interesting, the dark side, uh, because ac <laughs> that says a lot. It says, yeah, I, I said, to me, it says back then academia was very much in the ivory tower frame of yes. mind, right? We're going to do our science, and it's not going to be applied, and leave me alone. And to go to an aquarium would be considered the dark side because you're like actually doing something that interacts with the public and maybe is relevant to society of the day. Um, I think. I think the world has gotten way over that. Now the dark side is industry. Uh, and we can come to that a little later in the program. But, but I, but I want to stay with the aquarium piece and the role of aquariums in, in our modern world because you've been a pioneer in, in, in doing that. And first of all, aquariums are incredibly popular throughout the world. What, what I, I remember the statistics when I used to work for you at an aquarium, uh, but they're probably, you probably have them fresh. They're like well, more than all the sports. Yeah, more people go to zoos and aquariums every yeah. year than to all professional sports events combined. And so that, that gives an opportunity, but also I think it gives a responsibility because, you know, research has been done by an organization called New Knowledge. They survey the general public and they ask them, when it comes to information about the ocean, who do you place the greatest trust in? And they have academic scientists, government scientists, elected and appointed officials, large environmental NGOs, and aquariums. Hmm. And every year, the aquariums win. Uh, and every year, the elected and appointed officials are at the bottom. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but that, and, and to, to, to some extent, you know, that that tr some of that trust may be misplaced, but it gives aquariums an obligation and a, a responsibility to help educate the public. Yeah, that's, you know, that statistic, I wanna make sure that the listeners and the viewers hear that. More people go to aquariums and zoos than all professional sports combined. Correct. That's, that's just that's incredible. A lot of people. It's a lot of people. A lot of people. And it's a sleeping giant in, in our world in terms of an opportunity to connect with the public because you then follow it up by saying the trust. Now, the trust is important. They're going to believe what they hear at the aquarium. Yes. And uh, so you have a, 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 a like a sacred obligation to get it right, because your 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 disciples. This is like I I used to like to think about an aquarium, where people would come and worship the, the ocean. It's like a church, yeah. you know, where they come and they connect with something that's very important to them, the ocean and the animals there. And the animals are kind of like the ambassadors for their wild relatives and all that. So that, that there you, there's the framework. So what do, what do you do with that? I mean, it's a powerful thing to have in your hands. Well, first of all, I, th I think that uh, for most aquariums, the bench strength in science is very limited. And so if you're going to fulfill that trust, you have to bring the best scientists to the table to help develop the issues mm. that they think You've the always public been so needs good at that, to know yeah. about. And, and what scientists, most of them aren't very good at, 
is translating this information into stories that will engage, educate, entertain the public. But mm -hmm. that's what aquarium staffs do mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So if you have those partnerships, then I think you can deal with some of the big issues. And I think we're still in that, that transition so that we, we really need to be focused on the issues that are going to change the ocean in fundamental ways. Climate change is, is number one. You know, on that on that list, there are a lot of other issues: uh, eutrophication, overfertilization of coastal waters, plastics. But on a log scale, it you've got to, we've got to deal with climate change. I, I I'm in total agreement, Jerry. You know, and I've gotten, I mean, you 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 know you know me, you know my career, you know my work, and I've always been aware and uh, sensitive, and I've studied these issues firsthand. But I'm worried. So am I. I'm really worried now. I mean, it's in the last few years, it's really gotten to me. So, so am I. Because yeah. you know, we've always been good as a as a, a, a race, a human race, of dealing with crises. This crisis is very different from any that we've ever encountered before because there's so much inertia. There is no silver bullet. There's nothing that we can do that will turn this around quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to start. We've got to have a concerted effort. We've got to significantly and rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we're not going down the right path. Boy, that's very well said. Um, the way you described the, the inertia, there's no silver bullet. And it's coming at a time when, when people expect silver bullets. That's right. They want fast solutions. And they're actually, in my experience, people want to do the right thing if they only knew what it was Right. <laughs> yeah. in general. Uh, and this one, it, it's not something that you can you can you can find that one solution for. It's so it's so it's systemic in our system, and it's so uh, dramatic. You know, I was been looking at the uh, calculations of uh, how fast the climate's changing, and it's many thousands of times faster than it ever has right. changed. And the, the rate of change right. is is really the big the big issue. So, um, so there's an obligation to to take that knowledge and convey it to the public and then show solutions. This show is about solutions. So it's got to be, yeah, they've got, there's got to be hope. Yes. But no quick, no quick evidence of uh, progress. And there's sort of patience and constancy of commitment. They have to understand that, but there's got to be hope. You know, Jerry, I've always felt that the first, you know, this gets back to uh, a Cousteau quote that I've used before and I love, you know, the, the famous one where people only love what they what they understand, and they they only protect what they love, right. and and that was part of his philosophy right. to bring the ocean to people. So the first step is to show people what's in the ocean and engage them. Right. And walking into the aquarium, and we are we are actually on site at the Aquarium of the Pacific in in the studio. I walked in here and was gazing into the tanks of fish, and I'll I'll enjoy them on the way out. So the first part is is engagement, and it's really on an emotional level, I would say, right. with the animals. Is right. that right? I think so. You, you, and make them aware of, of what we could lose. Not only the beauty and the diversity of marine life, but all of the ecosystem services that we get from the ocean. And the fear of loss motivates people more than what we could gain. So, uh, Could I you explain what ecosystem services are for our listeners and viewers? I think it's, a, it's an important term. And, so ecosystem services then are the services that we get from healthy, productive, diverse ecosystems. So from the ocean, we get half the oxygen we breathe, we get food, and so on. And uh, those are in, in danger. So oxygen levels in the ocean are decreasing at all, all depths. Many of the fish stocks are declining. They're, 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 some of them are moving to stay within their preferred temperature range, but others are, are declining. Phytoplankton mass is, is declining. So if we lose those, that affects then the quality of life of human beings. And as you know, that recent report on extinction by mm -hmm. the UN said that we're on track to lose a million species by the end of the century, and many of those in the next few decades. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just losing animals and plants. It's you losing all of what they provide to our economies, to our quality of life. And I don't think that people get that. that that's the part that it's, it's hard to understand. 
I mean, I think ecosystem services is a, is a technical term we use, but it mean it's, it's benefits that people get from right. from the ocean, right. from from nature, from the earth, and our modern society is so removed in most right. cases. Like look look at us. I don't see anything in here uh, green or, or blue. It's we're in a totally artificial environment. However, it's the animals and the artificial and the natural environment outside these doors and in the ocean, and in the forests and in the jungles right. that in concert produce the conditions on earth in which it makes it a nice place for humans to live. That's, and it took a long time to make this a nice place for it humans to live. It took a long time to make it, it a took, nice... It took several <laughs> billion years before it was right for humans to evolve into the landscape. And the last time I checked, I didn't see any other planets around us that have these same conditions. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's right. I think that not even Elon Musk can move 10 billion people <laughs> to some other planet that has yet to be discovered. So our only choice is to create the equivalent of a new planet right here on Earth. Yes. And it is possible. We have knowledge and technology. The question is, do we have the willpower? And uh, that seems to be in short supply. That's an inter interesting way to put it. We have the we have the ability to create a new planet here on Earth, and I, I agree with you. I, I've, I've described it as, you know, the course of humanity has been such that we've, you know, migrated everywhere on the planet, and our population has swelled just so fast, and we've changed the Earth. Yes, we have. It's a new place now. And we shouldn't say that it's necessarily bad. It's, it's what it is. Right. We were, all, we were destined, this was our destiny right. as Homo sapiens to do this but we didn't understand the consequences of it until now. I think that's right. And now we understand the consequences of what we've done. And we also have the technology, as you just pointed out, and the science to make adjustments. And, the, and I like the way you said, create a new planet, accept a new planet here, right. and not be looking for another one someplace else yet. Um, I'm in total agreement with you there, and I think that's a fundamental um, uh, uh, epiphany or awareness that uh, that, that people should be aware, should need to come to. And I think aquariums are a place to start uh, through the immersive experience that you have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific and that connection. And then the real challenge, the real nut is how you take that fun, emotional, great experience that people have here and translate that into acquisition of new knowledge for them. And then further, that new knowledge has to evidence itself in changes in people's behavior, right? Yes. Is that the, is that, got the right? No, that's right. People don't go to aquariums to learn. Yeah. They come to have fun, to be entertained. But once they're in the door, if we can snooker them into learning something, <laughs> then we have succeeded. Otherwise, we're just a wet menagerie, and that's not very appealing to me. <laughs> no, very well put. Could you give me an example of, of uh, one or two that come to mind of the, that you're that you're conveying those lessons, those, that information to people. And I know you've got this fabulous new this new wing you've done. It could be in there or someplace else. Some some. So we've we've just opened this new wing yep. in the end of of May, and it is in thirty thousand square feet. It's devoted on a permanent basis. Not this isn't a changing exhibit. This is permanent, and it is to tell the state the changing relationship, the story of the changing relationship of people with the planet and what it will take to make that relationship more sustainable. It's clearly not. We're not on a trajectory that will lead to the kind of future that we want. And, and so there's it, it, a lot of aquariums are afraid to give bad news because people don't come to an aquarium right. to be discouraged. Right. But I don't think there's anything wrong with giving them bad news as long as you yes. then give them hope for a better future. Yes. And it's like the Joseph Campbell power of myth where you drag them down to the depths of despair, but then a hero comes along and leads them out. Oh. And in this like case, that. yeah. We got down into this bad situation because of all of us. Yeah. And the only hero that's going to get us out is all of us acting together. Wow. And um, <laughs> that's you're inspiring me <laughs> as you as you always have. So, so what, when we get down into the, at the granular level, what, what's one message that you, is it about uh, recycling plastic? Is it about uh, eutrophication or, that's in your exhibit path that you've, that you've innovated and brought to the public? Could you describe? Those, those are there, but I, I would say those are all second order. Okay. The number one order is we, if we have to reduce rapidly and significantly greenhouse gas emissions and while renewables 
Solar and wind will play a major role. They can't do it. Okay. We need to combine it with nuclear. And you know, German, uh, France, Germany, Sweden, they, they recognize this. And, and uh, the United States, though, we've been turning off for shutting down nuclear plants before they, uh, the, their, they, their licenses run out. Ohio, though, just last week, uh, decided they're not going to shut theirs down. And so I think there's an awareness that it's the largest single source of clean energy that we have in the United States and globally. We can't afford to lose it. And it, it is safe and clean. And the other thing is it has the highest energy density of any source of energy we have. Solar and wind are good but they're very low energy density, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. means they take up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. That means habitat taken away from nature. And since the, the deterioration, the destruction, fragmentation of habitat is the number one driver of extinction, we've got to be careful. Wow, you've really got my attention now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the number one message is the climate change, and I yes. agree with you. That's, that's the one that consumes me day and night. And uh, the new exhibit shows that how do you show it? What's, is, there a, is there an exhibit that shows a dead reef or something? Or well, we, we, we have, we, that's one of the things that we have. We, yeah, have, yeah. we have a dead and a live reef, and we have some super corals to show. That yeah, and you and I are working on that together, it, actually. We're working on yeah. that together. That's All right. right, well, that's a great example, yeah. then. So you're showing that there's the, as we heat the planet up with this carbon emissions and, and the greenhouse gas effect, the oceans heat up. Corals have a very hard time with that heating. Yeah. Uh, they, they're very delicate about that, and they die and reefs are providing ecosystem services, food, uh, mitigation from storm damage, um, uh, pharmaceutical potential, there's a lot of things. Revenue you, from tourism. Revenue from tourism is huge. All these yeah. things are coming, are being benefits and we're basically extinguishing them because of the climate impact right. and you're bringing that message to the public. And then on that one, like you said, you always want to have the hope you, right. you, you've got to have a, a, some place where there's some white light that people right. can go to. In this case, we can talk about the Super Coral for a minute. I, we've had an episode on it, but uh, why don't you tell me what your plans are with the Super Coral? Well, working with, with you and, yep. the, and the PIPA, yep. Phoenix Island Protected Area yep. Trust, we, we have had a forum uh, about Super Corals. We brought experts in from around the world. You were there. Mm -hmm. We've created a science on a sphere. Uh, film on super corals that has now gone to 150 aquariums and science centers around the world. And the next thing is to create an exhibit, a live exhibit showing super corals. And we'll, you're helping us to get the permission to yes, collect some yes, of these. Yes, with, the, with the government of Kiribati. With yes, the gov government yes. of Kiribati. And these yeah. corals are, uh, they, they, there's a possibility that they could be progenitors of reefs in the future elsewhere in the world. That, that, right. it's, it's a lot of work to determine and make yeah. that happen, but it's a possibility. And the reason is, listeners, Jerry knows this, but it's because they have grown naturally in a place in the Central Pacific that has gone through cyclical heating that the planet does on its own, no matter what we've done to the right. atmosphere. It's called El Nino. It's a natural cycle in the ocean. It, the ocean heats up every four, five, six years and then it cools down again. And it looks like nature may have bred through Darwinian selection some corals that are far more heat resistant right. than we find in the Great Barrier Reef, which is south of the equator, or Hawaii, north of the equator, places like that. So the idea is that these, uh, maybe in the future, when the oceans are, are too hot and the corals have died elsewhere, these could maybe be transplanted. There's a lot of things that have to be done about making sure there, isn't, there are pathogens introduced right. and you're not going to cause some new problem, which has happened many times in the past when we introduce new species. So this lessons learned have to be applied. We're not suggesting this is happening overnight, but it is, a, it is the hope in the coral story, right. which is part of the ocean story. So that's a great example. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, an individual can come in here, learn about the problem, see it visually through your expert exhibitry, and then... Um, there's the one solution. Of course, the other major solution is to change the way we're behaving on this planet <laughs> yes. and, and stop using oil in this manner. It's the worst use of oil. Oil has a lot of other uses, actually, that are quite... And coal's even a bigger effect. And coal is, is, even, is even worse. I, you know, I, I've been 
I, I've said this on a couple of podcasts, so I don't mind saying it again, but I, I keep thinking about it. The, you know, these lights here, I, I don't know, where does your electricity come from? Do you know? Is it a... We, we get most of it from Southern California Edison, so most of it comes from the grid, although we have a fuel cell. What's here. the original source of generation? Is it a, is it a it, com combination it, of things? It's a combination of things. So the, you, California has been quite aggressive in, for renewables within the electric sector. But we import electricity at night when the, the sun isn't shining, so we import electricity from Arizona and Nevada, and that is generated by a combination of fossil and nuclear. Okay. Um, so we're so not... The, the, the fossil part of it, the coal and the oil, is actually energy that was stored potentially back in the Jurassic yes. and is being re-released now. So I like to think about sunlight right. from the Jurassic right. is coming back now. Right and is rapidly heading us towards another Jurassic-like climate. So that is such a great, a great way to put it, and I'm so thankful to you, Jerry, for what you're doing, what the Aquarium of the Pacific is doing on this issue, and I encourage anybody within a thousand miles of Long Beach to come and see this exhibit and learn and pass the information on. And uh, I'd like you to, to come back on the show for the next segment, but uh, thank you very much. This has been a fantastic... Uh, um, thank you, Greg. Appreciate being here.